Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing coronary artery disease. Okay, so in this next video what I want to discuss is how to treat someone who is suffering from an acute coronary syndrome. Now remember in the acute coronary syndrome what has occurred is an atherosclerotic plaque in a coronary artery has ruptured and thrombosis has occurred on top of that and that thrombus is now hugely occluding blood flow through that uh, coronary blood vessel uh, and that uh, is either leading to unstable angina if you're lucky or it's leading to a myocardial infarction either a end STEMI or a, a STEMI. Okay so uh, what I now want to discuss then is how do we actually treat people who have currently got a thrombus occluding one of their coronary arteries. So two options are that we could do revascularization surgery which I've just talked about for the treatment of stable angina so if you've got someone currently suffering from an acute coronary syndrome you can if they're in hospital take them straight into the operating theatre and either perform percutaneous coronary intervention to try and install a stent in uh, to reopen that uh, occluded blood vessel or you can bypass the blood vessel with coronary artery bypass grafting. So those are two options for the revascularization of the tissue. However, there is one more thing that I want to discuss for uh, use in revascularizing blood vessels that are occluded uh, acutely by a thrombus, which is that you can use thrombolytics. Okay, so this is the final topic then that I want to discuss, thrombolytics. So thrombolytic agents then are agents which can cause thrombi to break up. So lysis means to break up, so this is going to break up um, thrombi. Okay, and the idea is that we're going to lyse the thrombus uh, and that will uh, reopen the blood vessel. Okay, yes, it won't do anything about the atherosclerotic plaque, but at least it will get rid of the thrombus, which is the thing that has currently uh, exacerbated the situation. Okay, so thrombolytic drugs. So to understand uh, how the thrombolytic drugs work then, we need to understand how normal um, lysis of blood clots occurs physiologically. So even if you've got a blood clot that is forming physiologically in the hole in the side of the blood vessel, in a hole in the side of the blood vessel, uh, then you don't want that to stay there forever. At some point it does need to gradually get lysed back so that you can replace the uh, blood clot, the hemostatic plug in this case, with um, new tissue new, uh, that's going to fill in the gap in the uh, blood vessel wall. Alternatively, uh, if you do have a thrombus forming in the middle of a per perfectly intact blood vessel, then the body needs to have some way uh, to actually lyse that thrombus. So indeed, the body does have endogenous mechanisms for lysing thrombi and the thrombolytic drugs are just going to take advantage of these mechanisms and activate these mechanisms so it's important for us in trying to understand the mechanism of the thrombolytic drugs to know what mechanisms that the body endogenously has for lysing blood clots. Okay so there is a protein then circulating in the blood uh, in its inactive form known as plasminogen and this, like all of the coagulation factors, is put into the blood by the liver. So the liver makes this protein called plasminogen, and this is the inactive form of this protein. Now, this can be activated to an active enzyme which is known as plasmin. So plasminogen can be activated to its active form, which is called plasmin. And once activated, this enzyme, and I'll draw it here, is capable of breaking down fibrin strands. So I'll colour plasmin in here in blue, and what's it capable of doing? It's capable of breaking down fibrin strands. So if I've got a fibrin strand here, so let's say this is a fibrin strand, which might be part of the fibrin mesh work uh, that is holding together the thrombus, what plasmin can do is it can go and make loads of little cuts in this polymer, remember a fibrin strand is made out of loads of fibrin monomers, it can break up the fibrin strand, break it into loads of little pieces, and therefore it can break up fibrin meshworks. Now you remember me telling you uh, that thrombi 
uh, or general blood clots, consist of two things. They consist of the platelet aggregate and the fibrin meshwork. But the platelet aggregate alone is not very strong. If you just have platelets aggregated together, stuck to each other, uh, because they've all been activated, it's not got any structural integrity. It'll just break apart easily. You need that fibrin meshwork that intersurrounds all of the platelets and holds them all together. And you should imagine the fibrin meshwork is like a spider's web uh, that surrounds and fills in all the gaps between the aggregated platelets and really gives the um, blood clot structural uh, soundness, structural integrity. So if you break down that fibrin meshwork, then you're just going to have the aggregated platelets now and they will just fall apart. So if we break down the fibrin meshwork, we break the blood clot up. So this is the mechanism then by which we're actually going to lyse blood clots. So plasminogen then is it this inactive form of plasmin that's circulating in the blood. It can be activated to plasmin, and I'll tell you exactly how it can be activated to plasmin in just a moment. And then uh, if it's activated to plasmin at the site where there is a blood clot, either a thrombus or a hemostatic plug, uh, then what will happen is it will be breaking down the fibrin mesh work there and that will cause that portion of the uh, blood clot that it has broken the fibrin mesh work down for to actually fall apart to lies. Okay, so now all that remains to see is then how does uh, plasminogen get activated to plasmin? Okay, well, um, there are two mechanisms by which plasminogen can be, well, two major mechanisms by which plasminogen can be activated to plasmin. Uh, and these involve two different enzymes. So there are two different enzymes which themselves have the job of uh, converting plasminogen to plasmin. And these are known as tissue plasminogen activator and also urokinase plasminogen activator, which is known as UPA. So tissue plasminogen activator this is abbreviated down to TPA, and I'll just write its name out in full. So this stands for Tissue Plasminogen Activator. And this is an enzyme which can be released by endothelial cells, uh, and which will activate the plasminogen nearby uh, the um, blood clot. Okay, so let me just draw this here. So if we have our endothelial cell, and let's say this endothelial cell is close to a blood clot that needs to be lysed, what this endothelial cell will do is it will release tissue plasminogen activator. The tissue plasminogen activator will then activate the plasminogen to plasmin, and the plasmin will then break down the fibrin meshwork of the blood clot that's nearby this endothelial cell here. Okay, so that's one of the mechanisms. So it relies on these endothelial cells that are near blood clots releasing tissue plasminogen activator. The other mechanism involves urokinase plasminogen activator, but again, this is going to involve endothelial cells. So urokinase plasminogen activator, often abbreviated to UPA, like so, is an enzyme that is released by the liver, actually, rather than endothelial cells. However, it's not active in it on its own. So this is circulating within the blood, but it's not going to be activating plasminogen to plasmin. Instead, what has to happen is it has to bind to an enzyme, sorry, to a receptor on the surface of the endothelial cells near the blood clot, known as the urokinase plasminogen activating receptor, the UPAR. Okay, so this is the urokinase plasminogen activating receptor. So these endothelial cells that are near blood clots, they have this urokinase plasminogen activator receptor uh, on their surface, and urokinase plasminogen activator will bind onto this, so I'll just put this here, and then it will become active once it's bound onto that, and then any plasminogen proteins that are passing by will then be activated by it to plasmin, and they will then lyse the fibrin meshwork of the blood clot and result in clot lysis. Okay, so to summarise then, the endothelial cells near a blood clot, either a hemostatic plug or a thrombus, are going to produce tissue plasminogen activator, and they're going to put on their surface urokinase plasminogen activator receptor, um, and the tissue plasminogen activator that they release will activate plasminogen proteins in the blood to plasmin, which will then lyse the fibrin meshwork of the blood clot and the urokinase plasminogen activator receptor will bind to urokinase plasminogen activator, activating it, and then it will break 
plasminogen down into plasmin, and plasmin will then break the fibrin meshwork of the blood clot down and also help with clot lysis. Okay, so uh, these then are the endogenous mechanisms for uh, lysing a blood clot, and this is why uh, after 12 hours of suffering an acute coronary syndrome, uh, the clot will start to lyse on itself because these mechanisms are uh, coming into play and they'll start to uh, reduce the blood clot down. However, what we can do to try and increase uh, the speed with which this will happen is give drugs that are going to activate this process, and these are the thrombolytic drugs. So, examples then of thrombolytic drugs. One of the examples, a very important example, is streptokinase. Now, streptokinase is an enzyme produced by certain streptococcus species, uh, so uh, such as streptococcus pyogenes, a very uh, important example of a streptococcus species of bacterium. So certain bacterial species, streptococcus species, uh, produce this enzyme known as streptokinase. And what can streptokinase do? Well, it's effectively just like one of these plasminogen activators, just like tissue plasminogen activator, it's an enzyme which can activate plasminogen to plasmin. And, this is, and we're talking about human plasminogen to plasmin. So these bacteria are capable of producing an enzyme uh, which can activate human plasminogen to plasmin and can result, therefore, in blood clot lysis. And this is actually one of the uh, virulent factors of these bacteria, that they produce this enzyme uh, which can result in clot lysis uh, of human blood clots. However, it's also very useful to uh, clinical pharmacologists because we can isolate this enzyme and we can then give it to people who uh, have uh, suffered an acute coronary syndrome and it will then go to the site of the uh, thrombus and will activate plasminogen proteins in the blood near the thrombus uh, to plasmin proteins and they will then break down the blood clot and that will occur much faster than just with the endogenous mechanisms. So streptokinase is an example of a thrombolytic drug. We also have uh, a number of examples of drugs which are recombinant versions of tissue plasminogen activator. So using biological engineering we have managed to make some other organism, most likely bacteria, make uh, an equivalent enzyme or recombinant version of our tissue plasminogen activator. Uh, and these drugs can also be used just like streptokinase. Uh, they can be given by injection uh, when we need a thrombus lysing, and they will then go to the site where the thrombus is and activate plasminogen to plasmin. So there are also recombinant tissue plasminogen activators. So recombinant tissue plasminogen activators, and there are multiple different examples of this. So uh, there is the drug alteplase, uh, which is a very important example. There's also tenecteplase and also retoplase. So these are all examples of um, recombinant tissue plasminogen activators where we've used recombinant DNA technology to uh, make some other organism make effectively the human tissue plasminogen activator enzyme and um, uh, we can inject this in and it will therefore result in the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin and therefore uh, the breaking up of the fibrin meshwork of the blood clot. So those are all examples of recombinant tissue plasminogen activators. Okay, so those are the thrombolytic drugs. So those can be given by intravenous injection generally uh, to someone who's actually suffering from the acute coronary syndrome in order to lyse the blood clot and therefore restore blood flow back uh, to the area that was supplied by that coronary artery. Okay, so those uh, are treatments then that can be considered if someone is actually having uh, a acute coronary syndrome and you need to uh, restore blood flow to the ischemic portion of myocardium. Okay, so with that then we will end this video on coronary artery disease.